this week on the Back Table Podcast. I've developed an entire program around not primarily treating the prostate cancer, and that's actually based off data that was presented from the guys in Switzerland. There's this guy named Dominic Abt, uh, who I've been on an advisory board with, but the guy's awesome. He published a paper that was like 12 patients who had a PAE and then went to prostatectomy, and he looked at the pathology of every index lesion of prostate cancer. And what it essentially showed was that, like, I think only in a handful of cases, like two or three, there was complete necrosis of the index lesion. And then there was partial necrosis in the majority of the rest. So what that tells me is that bland embolization for prostate cancer doesn't necessarily do the complete job. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or Backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. First, a brief word from our sponsors. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians. Clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad Radiation Protection Shields for all your fluoro-guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Back Table Podcast. Now, back to the episode. This is Michael Barraza, your host for today's episode, recording in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ninesh Parikh at the Moffitt Cancer Center. How are you, man? I'm doing good, man. Doing hot down here yeah, in sunny Tampa. Same in South Louisiana. So we're going to talk today about prostatic artery embolization or PAE in the setting of prostate cancer. But first, so you, how long have you been at, at Moffitt Cancer Center? I've been at Moffitt for seven years, came right out of fellowship in 2016. And uh, by the way, that is my absolute favorite topic of all time. PA in the setting of prostate can PA nice. in the setting of prostate cancer. Yes. It's, it's I'm ready. I couldn't I couldn't be more excited to spend the next hour or however long you want to spend talking about it. We got all day, my friend. Uh <laughs> so so are you at, at USF too or is, is Moffitt separate? No, the way it works is Moffitt's a standalone cancer center. Cool. Um it's it, it it's one of uh I don't know, probably twenty or thirty at least stand like true standalone cancer centers. Yeah. Many institutions have set up standalone cancer centers. The reason I say it that way is because you've got to, in order to be an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center, you've got to go through this really complex process from, you know, kind of applying to the NCI through a cancer center support grant, CCSG. And you've got to apply like every five years that shows you've got a certain amount of research, a certain amount of staffing, a certain amount of expertise, certain numbers of centers of excellence in certain areas. And and I'm by no means the expert in this area. We've got a whole team at Moffitt that does this, but basically yeah. you've got to kind of re-up every year. And then on top of that, there are other standalone cancer centers. There's something called the ADCC. I'm like blanking. I was just in a conference in Boston and I was just, I'll look it up yeah, uh, yeah. so that we know. But basically there's like 53 or something, or no, sorry, there's like 10 cancer centers that are part of the ADCC. Most of them are standalone cancer centers. So like us, MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, City of Hope, Fox Chase, Roswell Park, et cetera. That we're all we're all cancer centers. I can't remember. You told me this before. Do you guys have trainees that rotate with you? Yeah. So, oh, and so to answer your question, so yes, we have trainees. We are not oh. affiliated with USF. We are separate. Although, uh, and really, USF is a med school. The hospital, which is the teaching hospital for USF, is actually Tampa General Hospital. They are separate entities. To tell you the truth, most of the education that happens from USF actually happens at TGH. However, for example. We have residents and fellows from the USF radiology program and like their IRDR program. We have like a fellow at all times. We're very, we're nice. kind of very close with yeah. the USF guys and girls. And so it's, it's, it's pretty, it's kind of one of these mixed bags. And then for education, we've got our own ACGME accredited residencies and fellowships. So like radiation oncology, we've got a full residency, right? But we don't have like a surgery residency. We've got surgery residents from USF that come, but we do have a surgery oncology fellowship. Yeah, so, that's, that's kind of like where I am. But yeah, that sounds kind of like how we are here. I'm at Our Lady of the Lake Regional Medical Center. We have a lot of residencies, but we have more like rotating residents do. But I, I don't currently have 
diagnostic or interventional radiology residents. All right, well, let's uh, let's jump into this. From what we've talked about, you're a pretty high volume PAE operator and you've been doing it for a while. So but when and why did you start offering this for prostate cancer patients? Sure, sure. It's a good question. And just to give you the number, you know, kind of amount of volume, I, I started the program, just PAEs at Moffitt Cancer Center back in like 2017. I keep the data myself on an Excel spreadsheet that I update every single time um, I do a PAE. And I think I did 200, number 250. I actually did three on, what was it, Tuesday. And so number 250, 248, 49, and 50 were on Tuesday. And then we've got a couple other guys actually that are now doing them as well, which is awesome. And I can't wait till like we have every single room filled with a PAE. Let, let me let me be clear though, they're not all for cancer. Uh, we still do a lot of BPH as well because there's plenty of cancer patients at the hospital and at the cancer center that need you know, a PAE. So I should be clear, they're not all for, for prostate cancer. My own specialty and the stuff I'm really passionate about is in the setting of prostate cancer, but all of that 250 is not. About half yeah. is probably in the setting of prostate cancer. Well, so let me ask you this, Nine. When you, you know, we're talking about doing PAE in the setting of prostate cancer, are you doing this for the prostate cancer or for symptoms related to, you know, BPH? Yeah. So it's a great question. So I've developed an entire program around not primarily treating the prostate cancer. And that's actually based off data that was presented from the guys in Switzerland. There's this guy named Dominic Abt, uh, who I've been on an advisory board with, but the guy's awesome. And I think thinks about things very similarly. I don't know him very well, but he published a paper that was like 12 patients who had a PAE and then went to prostatectomy. And he looked at the pathology of every index lesion of prostate cancer. And what it essentially showed was that like, I think only in a handful of cases, like two or three, there was complete necrosis of the index lesion. And then there was partial necrosis in the majority of the rest. So what that tells me is that like bland embolization for prostate cancer, and I'm sure you'll ask me about Y90 at some point, which we can get to, but but bland embolization for prostate cancer doesn't necessarily do the complete job. Really quickly, to your original question that I realized I didn't answer, I started it mostly because I just wanted to do PAEs. I actually never did one in fellowship, but I read the data and I actually matched into urology. I was going to go to Leahy Clinic and then I didn't and decided I wanted to do IR. And then throughout kind of residency and fellowship, I was always interested in IR and, and NGU. And then I just was like, man, PAE sounds amazing. And as kind of the fathers of PAE around the world were developing it in like the late, I don't know, 2000. I guess the early 2010s and stuff like that, as they were getting, you know, the randomized control trials and everything, all the data together, I just kept reading it. And I was like, this stuff sounds incredible, even as just kind of like an idiot resident. So when I got out of residency, I just came to Moffitt and I was like, man, what I really want to do is PAE. And like most things, I was really just lucky and naive. So I went, I went to like the GU tumor board to the GU chairman, like, I don't know, a couple months after I after I got to Moffitt and I said, Hey, you know, I want to talk to like the GU team about PAE. And he was like, sure. And luckily his name is Julio Passing. He is absolutely amazing. The guy is like, he's been in Moffitt for quite some time. He's the chair of the GU program. The guy is absolutely fantastic. And what I mean by that is he's very open. He's very supportive of new ideas. And so I just presented the data. I actually told these guys like, Hey, here's all the data. And I, I like studied and studied and studied and put a couple slides together and said, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to start doing PAEs. And they said, okay, sure. What's the patient population? And I was like, well, maybe before surgery. And they were like, doesn't matter. I was like, what do you mean? They were like, well, you do it before surgery. There's no data that shows that it actually, that size of, of the prostate helps. I was like, ooh, that's a tough one. So I started looking it up and lo and behold, they were absolutely right. And our GU guys are, our GU guys are excellent, very data driven. They know their stuff, obviously. And I was like, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so it turns out that the only thing that changes when you account for size in terms of prostatectomy, and, and this was a few years ago when I looked at this, so I'm happy to stand to be corrected, but for the most part, volume only, kind of volume is only correlated with estimated blood loss, but clinical and, and oncologic outcomes really don't change. Even like the state doesn't change. And I was like, oh man, this sucks. So what I did was one of my radiation oncologues, she actually wasn't even, she was kind of just a mentor. And I should say just, she is a mentor and she's a G, we did a lot of Y90 and stuff like that. And of course she's a, she's a liver and GI radonc. And so I was telling her about it and she's like, oh, she's like, that sounds crazy and cool. And so she randomly had a patient that she sent who didn't have cancer, 
that's how the program started. The guy, the guy had like rectal cancer or something. I did the PAE. He did pretty well. He ended up dying like within a year or two because they had metastatic rectal. And then, and then not like two, two weeks later, the chair of GU had sent me like a 48 year old who was in urinary retention. And he was like, they called me and the guy was like in the urgent care. Um, and he was being seen, I think for like lymphoma or something like that. And I was like, oh, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll try this. And so I did it. And it's funny, the first time he showed up, he, he was in the holding bay. He didn't, actually, I'm sorry, he wasn't in retention already. He showed up, he was in the holding bay. He came, in, he came into the ER for something unrelated, but had like problems with urination. But he was uh, definitely overweight and had like a prostate that was 200 grams or something. So he shows up for me to do it five days later because I was like, yeah, I'll book him, let's do it. And like the nurse actually says to me, hey, his potassium's seven. I was like, oh God, it's hemolyzed. All right, fine. So we redraw it, you know, we're waiting and she's like, yeah, it's still seven. I was like, it can't be. So then we redraw it the third time and it was seven. I was like, ah, oh, shit. So then I was like, why don't we get an EKG? And she gets an EKG and there's PT waves. And I was like, oh my God, this can't be real. So we put in a Foley and out comes like three liters immediately. And the guy was, so he goes to the ICU. There was some like, it, it was absolutely hilarious. Like he's got hyperkalemia, he's got PT waves. Like the guy read the book. So they take him to the ICU because they were like, holy cow, what are we going to do as we correct his potassium? I was like, God damn it. There goes my first and probably only PAE. Luckily, said fellow crushed it. They fixed his potassium. I got him back, did the PAE. It did actually take me two chances because I just like was so green. I had no idea how to get, like it was just a painful case. And the radiation dose went way up. Anyways, long story short, got him off the catheter. And from there, like, my chair of urology was just like, yeah, let's start doing this. And so it was a mixed bag because what would happen is we always have, from there, the chair of urology was really interested, but what would end up happening is all of our patients or the majority of our patients get presented at a program specific tumor board, which is standard for, for cancer centers. So, you know, they'd be talking about patients who have large prostates and where to go, you know, is it surgery, is it radiation? If it's radiation, is it the standard 39 fractions? Is it you know, can they hypofractionate? Can they do brachy? And we, they'd be having all this discussion. And I remember one day, the now chair of GU, he used to, I'm sorry, of radiation oncology, he used to be the section head of um, GU radiation oncology. And yes, we have that, like GU Radon. His name is Kasha Yamoa. He, he's also awesome. And, you know, I just like spoke up in Tumor Board. I was like, yo, Kasha, I was like, why don't you just let me do a PAE first? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I think I can get you like 20, 30% volume reduction. I think it was like a random patient. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, I'll get you 20, 30% volume reduction and you should be able to do brachy uh, or whatever you want. I was like, and by the way, more importantly, I'll fix this clinical symptoms before, before you do your radiation. And he was like, okay, let's try it. That guy did well. He sent another guy like a few weeks later who had already had radiation and the guy was miserable. And I did a PAE and the guy did great. So all it was, was luck and support from the other guys at the institution. And then just like, after that, we just started building the case. And so I kind of started honing in on pre-radiation or neoadjuvant PAE in the setting of radiation. And then I would also do it on post-radiation prostatitis. We started publishing. I have like a prospective trial now with an IDE from the FDA, which was very painful and took two and a half years, but kind of all of that when you put it all together, you start to get a program that looks like, hey, we should use this in various facets in the setting of prostate cancer. Totally. So let, let's see if we can summarize this because it, it sounds like it's it's got utility in a lot of different clinical scenarios related to prostate cancer. So, you know, number one, you may be able to shrink a prostate down to appropriate size for brachytherapy. Two, you know, you're going to decrease the volume, which even though, you know, you said there's not data for it could be useful in the operating room, but Three, I mean, these patients have enlarged prostates. You're also getting the effect of PAE on lower urinary tract symptoms. Am I missing anything? Well, let me let me actually change it um, a little bit. And it's too bad we I like I gave a talk at SIR last year, and I give this talk at Stream every year. Um, and I gave grand rounds at UT Houston where I talked about this. I, I wouldn't actually think about it that way. I'd think about it the following way: you either do it if you're talking about prostate cancer alone, and you say PAE as you know in the setting of prostate cancer. The two arms are before or after therapy, definitive therapy, definitive therapy. And then when you talk about definitive therapy, you can talk about, as, as most people know, when it comes to prostate cancer that's locally confined, 
it's either surgery or, or radiation. And then within surgery, there's multiple modalities. Within radiation, there's multiple modalities, right? So I would say that if you look at the surgical route, there's actually no role before prostatectomy. However, there is a role potentially before focal therapy, which is, which is gaining uh, popularity, right? So low-grade disease, maybe you're going to take, like maybe your urology colleagues or, or in some places the, the radiologist, uh, him or herself, going to do cryoablation or IRE or something like that. You actually can do a PAE prior to that to help. And I'll go into how I think about the symptoms versus um, size. If it's not before surgery, then the other branch point is if it's before radiation. And then if it's after definitive therapy, it's if patients have medically refractory ra uh, radiation prostatitis. All right, so let me break that down a little bit. When you talk about before radiation, you there's two there's two things you're really looking for. You're looking for clinical improvement and you're looking for volume reduction. And to be honest with you, the clinical improvement is the key that I always stress to patients. Even though both my radiation oncology colleagues and the patients are always like, oh, did it shrink, did it shrink, did it shrink? Anybody who knows prostate artery embolization knows that you really are focused on clinical improvement irrespective of the volume reduction, right? So the number one thing you really want to do this for is, of course, clinical improvement. So men who've got lots, I usually say if it's like AUA greater than 10 or 11, something like that, because when they get radiation, you know that there's a higher risk of post-radiation symptoms, either acute and chronic, and we can talk about that as well. But basically, with a larger gland and a, and a higher baseline LUTs, irrespective of the modality of the radiation, there's actually a higher likelihood of them developing acute and or chronic toxicity, GU toxicity. Okay. So the whole goal is number one, to improve their symptoms prior so that no matter what, they can urinate and get through radiation. And then the second point is to actually reduce the volume. You reduce the volume, a couple of different things happen. First of all, you may make them eligible for a different modality. Like I said, the standard fractions is like 39 fractions, right? But if you can actually hypofractionate and get them down to 20 or 28, you know, 39 fractions is like eight weeks because it's five days a week, right? So, so that sucks for, for men. That's eight weeks every day. If you can even cut that in half, then men are happy, patients are happy, and, and the, uh, the doctor is usually happy. And then if you can actually cut it down to SBRT, which is typically five treatments over one week, or you can even do the brachy, your radiation oncologists are super happy, right? So you can understand that from a volume perspective, the whole goal is to get the volume as low as possible, all right? And then if you go to the focal therapy perspective and arena, again, these guys who've got 120, 130, 150 cc prostates, those are the guys that you want to help your urologist and say, hey, I can shrink that. And again, we can get into the numbers and I've kept the data pretty closely. Uh, we should have something coming out here soon for toxicity and we'll have another one coming out here soon for um, volume reduction. But the point is, if you can guarantee or, or get a certain amount of volume reduction prior to focal therapy, you make life much easier for them, right? So either way, it's a neoadjuvant treatment prior to definitive therapy for prostate cancer. Okay. Uh, what about radiation prostatitis? What's the rationale for PAE for that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, so this this patient population is crazy. And like, this was also just kind of happenstance, like it just randomly happened. Yeah, this is a new one for me. Yeah, so, so chronic prostatitis, well, so prostatitis is really broken down. Um, I think it's the NIH. I don't remember who, who categorizes it because we wrote a paper a few years ago on this topic and we have kind of an update coming out for it. So prostatitis is broken down into acute and chronic, infectious and non-infectious, or bacterial and non-bacterial. And chronic non-bacterial prostatitis is like the most common type, you know, afflicting, I don't know, millions of men across the nation. Usually it's the result of some sort of insult to the prostate. And then what you've got after is a resultant symptomatic picture that people don't really fully understand. And they're not sure if it's necessarily from in inflammation. You know, obviously it's not from infection because they've ruled out any sort of UTI or anything like that. So if you think about radiation prostatitis, it falls into this category of chronic prostatitis. And then even more, the way that men feel it is something called chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So I call it CP slash CPPS. So the radiation is probably the injury or insult to the prostate. They've got the radiation, and then I believe it's usually a low low level of inflammation that just causes all sorts of problems for the patient. And most typically, why you know how it's different than BPH, there you know a lot of people will will talk about BPH in terms of irritative or obstructive symptoms or irritative avoiding symptoms. What you'll see with with chronic prostatitis is 
men, first of all, they're medically refractory and I'll go into what the medications are, but they're medically refractory and they usually have a degree of pain or baseline pelvic discomfort. And that's something that BPH patients just don't have, right? So that pain and pelvic discomfort, and you actually have to use an entirely different categorization and use something called CPSI, which is the chronic, chronic, prostati chronic prostatitis symptom index. I use that instead of IPSS or AUA for monitoring. Actually, I use that alongside IPSS and AUA because there's a lot of overlap. And again, that was recommended to me by my chair of urology because you can tease out a lot of different symptoms that just seem to come from nowhere. And when you think about chronic prostatitis, they usually say it's the three A's, so alpha blockers, anti-inflammatories, and antibiotics for any prostatitis. Well, most of these men are typically refractory to all those things. Actually, 50% of men who have chronic prostatitis are refractory to all three of those. And there's not really been anything that's been demonstrated to help. And the reason that I think the embolization helps is because what I think it does, it's kind of like what they do for GAE or some of these other ones. I think it just kind of kills the cells and reduces the amount of systemic inflammation as a result. I'm sorry, local inflammation as a result. Man. And so, I mean, how did you identify this as, you know, having efficacy for this? Well, like I said, I mean, it, you sometimes get like a mixed bag, right? So you'll get a man with a large gland who claims, and this is the problem with patient reported outcomes, of course, he'll claim that his AUA is like three, right? But now I've learned what I ask these guys as I say, so if your AUA is three, are you telling me like you, you remember when you were 30 and you urinated no problem after a night out? Are you telling me it's the same? And most men are like, oh, no, 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 of course not. But that's just my age. And I'm like, no, no, that that's the baseline. You got to use the baseline. So what, what you find out is I had a couple of men who were referred to me that had to stop radiation because they had such bad symptoms. And then as I, and then, then I had a few others who had either a large or normal sized prostate, but had like really bad, either obstructive symptoms or just irritative symptoms. And so they were like, dude, can you just do anything? And similar, you know, we always get this question in IR. It's like, just do something. And you're like, all right, great. I've got a hammer. Let me see if it fits the nail. And even though I'm, I'm typically against that philosophy, you know, where there's a will, there's a way as far as like helping some of these guys because they are so miserable. I remember like my fifth patient with chronic prostatitis, he worked for like the city of Tampa and they wouldn't pay for his, um, they wouldn't pay for his, the first, there was something going on with paying for his, his PAE. He like knocked down the door of the pre-op bite and was like, I do not care. I'm so miserable. I need to try this. He just like showed up, you know, for, for an appointment. And he was like, can we just do this now? I was like, uh, sure. I was like, let's just do it. So really a lot of it was, was based on just how miserable these men are. Absolutely. I mean, we get in this scenario all the time and, you know, they, they get sent to you sometimes as kind of a last option. Like, can you, can you do anything for this guy? Um, yeah. Well, well, that's how PA was discovered, right? Demerit up at Hackensack in 99 or whatever it was when he published that paper. I think they just happened to call him and be like, hey, this guy's bleeding. Can you do something? And he did something that kind of spawned an entire field. It's awesome. So now let's talk about how you work these patients up. I mean, it sounds like most of these patients are coming through your, your GU tumor board. Yes and no. Actually, now we've just got a full algorithm. There's, there's so, so remember, we're program specific. So internal to Moffitt, there's probably six GU radiation oncologists. And it's like, it's almost just a workflow that we've set up that AUA greater than 10 or gland volume greater than like 45, they typically will just send for PAE. It's a neoadjunct of PAE. And that's not, it's not like 100%. It's still obviously they're all a little bit different. But basically, they're either coming through tumor board or they're coming through that avenue. You know, if, if they're kind of already been worked up, they don't necessarily go through the tumor board as far as prostate cancer therapy. Like if they're coming to Moffitt just for the radiation, then that is what it is. Or they get seen in multidisciplinary clinic anyways. So that's kind of the local tumor board. They'll come, they'll come out of there. They'll usually have a PSA and an MRI. And I actually think that every patient, even for BPH undergoing a PAE should have a PSA and an MRI. And I know people will disagree with me, but I, maybe it's just because I'm biased towards cancer. But I think the last thing you want to do is treat a patient for whom there's a concern for cancer and or has cancer and could be eligible for a prostatectomy, right? So it, you'll do a lot of favors with the urologist if you refer those guys back, right? You get a patient who sees you or, you, you know, you talk around the country, a lot of men will go, will come into an IR division for a PAE because of direct-to-consumer marketing, right? So they'll show up directly. If you're working them up correctly and you're calling your urologist, and I know people may kill me for saying this, you call your urologist, you're like, hey, I, I was going to do PE on this guy, but I'm worried about cancer. I mean, he's he's indebted to you, right? Now, obviously, you got to find guys that 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 work well with you, but 
I'm sure plenty of my colleagues around the country would agree that get the get the MRI, get the PSA. If there's a pyrads four or greater lesion, you know, look at the MRI yourself. Make sure you understand the differences uh, in technique, so you can call out your body colleagues and make sure you're you're reading the MRIs. And then I usually get a PSA and an MRI, do an IPSS and or an AUA, and then we go from there. Do you do anything in like Euroflow or anything? Do you have any requirements for that um, before they come to you? Nope. Cool. Nope. Nope. For a couple of different reasons. I mean, the urologists themselves will tell you it's like just a pain to do and to get. Now, I talked to my I talked to my chair of urology and he was like, yeah, we're not interested in having that. He was like, you can do it if you want in your own clinic, but why? He was like, I was like, yeah, fine with me. No problem. <laughs> I'm never doing that myself. Right. And he was just like, it's kind of a pain. And if their symptoms are bad enough, like who cares? I was like, I'm with you, man. Well, it's also different, you know, I think in the in the setting of prostate cancer rather than strictly for BPH and LUTs. Right. Right. I, I agree. So all these patients, once they get their diagnosis, if their gland is above the threshold of 45 cc's, they're getting sent to you for assessment for PAE. Is that correct? I, I wouldn't say every single one. What I would say is the radiation oncologist already knows to screen them for it. And so if they've either got a large gland with LUTs, they've got, so if they've got if they've got any baseline LUTs at all, they typically will will think about it. If they've got a large gland and that specific radiation oncologist thinks that they might be eligible for either hypofrac, SBRT, or brachy, then they'll also send. And so you got to remember, we get a lot of patients, like 50% of our volume of patients drive from greater than two hours away. I know it's crazy that I know that stat, but that's because I have an administrative position. <laughs> I that like 40% of my time is administrative at the institution. But my point is, a lot of those patients will send back out to the community to get their radiation. And in those situations, I'll still do the PAE, but they're not as in tune with necessarily getting brachy and or uh, hypofrac. A couple specific clinical scenarios where I don't know if there's a role for this or not, and I'm curious, do you ever get patients sent to you with larger prostates, but they have relatively locally advanced disease? Yes. So it depends on when you say locally advanced. And th we presented a poster last year at SIR, and I'm just trying to figure out how to write this up because it actually doesn't make all that much sense to me. Uh, like my data seems better than I think that it actually is. And so I don't say that, I don't say that egotistically. I feel like I'm just not telling the story right. <laughs> Sounds like it, a good problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. But like in practice, it just doesn't make sense to me. So basically like- I get it. Like- when you say locally advanced, locally advanced can have a variety of definitions, right? Locally advanced can mean extra prostatic extension. It can mean seminal vesicle invasion. It can mean invasion into the rectum. It can also mean that there's central, there's central occlusion of like the urethra. So that last case when, or that last situation, when it's kind of like when you have a central tumor, that's the, that is the cause, at least the predominant cause for the obstructive symptoms those guys don't do as well. And that's the paper I'm trying to write to figure out because like, I rarely see those guys respond the same way that someone with like, you know, just BPH and then a few peripheral zone lesions. I rarely see those guys have a problem, but the guys with central gland tumor, oh man, a different beast altogether. So a couple things, right? If it's in the transition zone, first of all, so 85% of cancers are in the peripheral zone which is why most biopsies and most treatments that are focal come transrectally. Second thing is that, so that leaves 15% that are in the transition zone. The, for those 15% of tumors that are in the transition zone, uh, they tend to be more aggressive, and we don't really know why that is, but they tend to be more aggressive at diagnosis. In addition, if they are the cause of obstructive symptoms, they already tend to be more advanced, meaning the, the, the tumor's larger, it's probably either invaded or significantly obstructed the urethra. And, you know, similar to the biliary tree, like that tumor that obstructs the common bile duct really isn't very fun. Um, it can be really challenging. Patients feel it when you're putting in the biliary drain and you're dilating upright. This is kind of the similar thing. Tumor just does not, it, it's not malleable. It's not like lymphoma. It's pretty like plastered in there. So prostate cancer, especially in the middle of the prostate, can really plaster against the, the urethra. And when men already have symptoms from it, it's it's not responsive to the embolization like BPH is. And I don't I don't really know why that is, but I always caution men that if there's that's the other reason I get the MRI. If I if I see central tumor, I'm always like, oh man, we're gonna have to be careful. I don't, I have to couch your expectations. Whereas if there's peripheral zone tumor or tumor that's not seen on the MRI and they've got a ton of BPH, I'm like, yeah, you're gonna do great. Ninety percent of the time, you'll have a significant improvement in your symptoms, just like all the BPH population. 
But if they've got obstructive tumor, I mean, I'm always like, yeah, 70% chance we should still do it. I don't know if we'll get the same volume reduction. And for some reason, the prostate cancer just doesn't, it just doesn't respond the same way as the BPH. Interesting. Okay. Another scenario I'm curious about, you know, we know that the the bigger the gland, the the easier the embolization, at least in my experience. Are there any circumstances where you are getting sent these patients or considering PAE for, for smaller glands? So yes, a couple of different things. So first of all, if we're doing it before radiation and men have like a 25 cc gland, for example, right? I'll say, listen, I, I can try it, but that that patient might be better served either to have a TERP or a mist or something, right? And it'll just depend on, on what's really happening. 40, 45 cc's, I think you can still do the PAE and you'll be all right. On the flip side, when it's chronic prostatitis, I'll try any size gland that you have. So I've done, I think the smallest size I've done is like 23 cc's. Yeah, it's really small. It's not, the prostatitis patients are never fun. It's, it's a tough procedure. It's not fun. It's like you're kind of finding a needle in a haystack. It's like, Sometimes they'll do well. The prostatitis patients don't have the same high response rate. They also, I couch them and I'm like, you know, it's not a 50-50, but the data shows maybe 70, 75% improvement or chance of improvement, I mean. And so, you know, you still got to do the case, but every time I see a prostatitis, prostatitis patient, I'm like, damn, this is going to suck. But so to, to your point, if it's neoadjuvant, then I would say, you know, 40, 45, I'm happy to do it. And the reason... I'll still take it on is because the smaller the gland, the better the radiation and the better the plan for radiation. Okay. Got it. So that's that's the main reason to do it. Okay. In terms of the technical details, is, is there anything different to doing PAE for prostate cancer relative to that for BPH with LUTs? Good question. So I believe that if you're going to do it in the neoadjunctive setting, you really got to use the perfected technique. And the reason I say it is because their data is real. You know, Francisco's data, I was talking to him about this at Guest last year, and I just kind of started to use it significantly. And I was like, I was still trying to figure out how in the hell he does it. And it actually dawned on me when he said it, he was like, yeah, it's different for every patient. I was like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, how? of course it is. I was well, like, what the hell? Let's do this. Let's, let's, okay. So a lot of our listeners are going to be trainees. Uh, you and I are familiar with the perfected technique because I, you know, started doing P like you did. I saw one in training and then really got into it just reading about it when it was starting to develop. And so I just read everything there was available on my own. And then uh, I was lucky to get to travel and visit Ari Isaacson when he was at UNC and he was you know, sure. really, and he let me spend a day with him watching him do it. So let's tell our trainees, what is the perfected technique compared to just doing a routine embolization? Okay, sure. So good. That, that's a good point. So most time, our trainees will learn that when you're doing an embolization, you really, uh, you start distal and then you come back proximal, right? And typically you start with the smaller beads and then you size up. So the prox, uh, sorry, the perfected technique stands for proximal embolization first, then distal. So what does that mean? So you kind of, ba- you, you park your microcatheter proximally in the prostatic artery. You embolize from there. And then you go distal, even though you think they're stasis, you go distal, ideally into each branch, if you can see each branch, and you then even give more embolic distally. And the thinking is, number one, you can pack in more, which results in more necrosis, but the pathophysiology, my understanding, and this is not my theory, this is what Francisco told me and a couple other people told me, and what they published, is that there's these tiny little collateral pathways throughout the prostate that develop that can still be shut down when you're a little bit further in and you can't see them if you're proximal. So it stands to reason that if those are open, you can then go and embolize more. Now, the other thing that I learned both from him and Shavank in Miami is start with small beads, so ones to threes, and then use threes to fives later. So what I'll usually do now is once the threes proximally, and, and of course, this is where Francisco was so key to like kind of helping open my eyes last year when we randomly had this discussion. He was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give like three, four, five cc's depending on the size of the gland of like once the threes, just depends. And then I'll switch to threes to fives. And, he, and him and Siobhan both told me this, when you go distal, you stay threes to fives because those collateral pathways, like you just, you don't want them to open up randomly. And if they are open, sorry, you want them to be open. You want to shut them down. You don't want to get through them with the ones at threes because you're really deep into the organ. 
So in fact, it's funny. I'll usually say to my techs or to my, uh, but if you have like, if you can get really far in there, I'll usually joke with my techs and with my fellows like, oh yeah, hopefully the catheters will be coming out of the penis sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they know I'm happy about the case if I say that. But no, so so basically you start proximally with ones to threes, give a few CCs, and then you start, then you give threes to fives, then you go distal and give more threes to fives. And yes, it uses the, the idea of sizing up. A lot of my fellows will always ask me, well, if you're going distally, shouldn't you use ones to threes to pack it in more? And I think the thinking is, if there are those collateral pathways that you can't see, you just don't want to to mistake them. Right. I, I'd, I'd rather not send 100 to 300 into the pudendal or the penis and the rectum. And you know. Correct. Question for you, Nine. Are you using 100 or 300 and perfected technique on your routine PAE for BPH and LUT? I do now, yeah. And for chronic prostatitis. Yep. I use them for all of them, if I can. So if, yeah, you know, there's a couple of things to think about there. If for some reason there's, like I had one the other day where... It was a uh, prostatitis case. The guy actually had seeds, and so it was like impossible. He probably had 50 seeds in his prostate. I mean, it was friggin', it was just, it sucked. And his prostate volume was like 40. So the whole case, and I knew it was going to suck, but he was on he was on a catheter. And he had had post-radiation hemorrhagic cystitis. So it had sucked, like every which way around. But he, the, he my, that same urology colleague actually went in and cauterized a bunch a year ago. Uh, he was doing fine, and then he ended up going into retention, never had any bleeding, but went into retention, and then he was like, is there anything you can do? And I was like, oh, man, I guess I'm going to have to try a PAE. So when I was doing the case on Tuesday, he had like this crazy collateral that went to the penis, intraprostatic penile collateral, and I was way deep in, but for some reason, I typically use concertos. The concerto just wouldn't go. It wouldn't make like the final turn. You know, he had torturous vessels. Everything sucked about it. Well... I, ch- I put in two S coils because those did go and like it didn't totally sh- sh- shut down flow. So flow was like, flow was like really stagnant. And I was like, you know, this guy is miserable. And my fellow standing there like, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, we're going to embolize. He's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah. I was like, the guy is miserable. And trust me, he'll deal with a base of penis that has some, some, you know, ulcers if he needs to, or even tip of penis that has ulcers. And he's already on the catheter. So it's not like I'm going to like, if, he, if we don't fix this, it's not like he's going to have erectile function to be worried about. So I was like, we're, I, I closed my eyes and just shot. And basically- Shot with like, 300 to 500? Yeah. So in that situation, to your point, I did threes to fives because I was like, no, I don't know what's happening here. On the other side though, there was good supply. I felt pretty confident. And I just, I started with ones to threes and then I used threes to fives to finish. And his penis didn't fall off, did it? Well, it's only been a week. So let's see. Okay. It's not even been a week. Yeah, okay. As you know, the ulcer situation- takes it usually happens about a weekend so i've no, had, no, I've I, had I don't because i don't get complications <laughs> then you're not doing enough and you know <laughs> that mike uh another question for you nine so the ones that you're doing and if you are doing these for for you know i know i brought up locally advanced disease well, let's say extra prostatic extension or seminal vesicles are there any other considerations for um doing the embolization on those patients you know does it look different is there anything else you have to do so definitely looks different. Ultimately, no, there's not necessarily anything you do differently. Um, I'll still do the procedure. You know, when I got my IDE, a lot of radonks and urologists brought up this point that like, how did I know that there wasn't increased collateral flow because the prostate cancers are supposed to be quote unquote hypervascular. This is another project that we, we presented a poster on and I, didn't, I couldn't figure out how to write it up. And by the way, for any listeners, if anybody's great at taking these and translating posters to papers, I would love some help. So I'll just put that out there. Feel free to contact me. But it's funny, when you're in the artery, the prostate cancer is actually not as hypervascular as the BPH. I know it sounds crazy. Yeah, on the MRI, they say that it's hypervascular. But I actually think on prostate MRI, for anybody that's done any body fellowships or reads prostate MRI, they do like kind of these curves that show the enhancement of the prostate cancer as compared to the rest of the normal prostatic parenchyma. I almost feel like it's delayed enhancement and the prostatic parenchyma is like early enhancement and not, not to get too geeked out here, but in the Pyrads 2.0 and even in the updates, enhancement only really upgrades from like a three to a four, if I'm remembering that correctly. So my point is that it's not even really that important, the enhancement of the, of the, of the glands. So my point there is to say, most likely, no, you don't need to worry about anything. My second point is to say, just watch out for any possible collaterals because if it is invading like, you know, the rectum or something, of course, like any other part of the body, 
you know, tumor invading another area could lead to some crazy vasculature. And that's what the radiation oncologist and the, and the urologist who, who approved the IDE brought up as well. Like, how did I know? And I was like, well, I published a paper that showed that there was not any untoward situations as far as non-target embolization. So that's the best way that I know. But for the most part, what we found when we did that poster was, if anything, the prostate cancer itself is hypovascular, and I did not necessarily see any increased number or frequency of collaterals. Got it. Another technical question. So, you know, I don't know your protocol for your routine PAEs, uh, but I know that you have a lot of experience and, you know, you, you may not have as a involved of pre-procedure protocol as somebody else, you know, like CTAs or cone beam CTA, but clearly for the ones with prostatitis, these sound like harder cases, you know, they're often smaller glands. What is your approach to those, you know, finding these smaller arteries uh, and getting into them? Do you do, you know, cone beam CTA? So good question. So I'm aware that there's probably controversy out there around pre-op workup and cone beam CTA, depending on who you ask, right? And even among, within our group, I mean, you'll find different things. So first of all, my workup is still an MRI. I don't do a CTA of the pelvis or anything like that. The second thing, even on the small glands, we don't have the MO assist software. And I was also having this conversation with Francisco, and I think his data is awesome about the MO assist software. However, it's kind of like your kids and using calculators. If you don't actually learn the anatomy, then when the software doesn't work, you're kind of hosed. So I truthfully don't change anything about my technique when it comes to the small glands. The third thing I say is I actually do a CTA or sorry, well, we don't have a Comey. We have a 4D CT. We have like a CT on tracks. So every single time my catheter is in the PA, I'll do a full cone beam or 40 CT, whichever, whichever you want to call it. And, and for me, that's important for a number of different reasons. I think on the big glands, it's important to see the entire uh, volume of the prostate so that you can feel really comfortable about doing perfected and getting distal. It just confirms for you that no matter what there is, there's no, there, there's no collateral flow. And I'm kind of like, you know, the, the 10 minutes it takes to do that of all the things we're doing, why is that where you would, you know, quote unquote, save time. So in my opinion, like I don't, I don't see the issue with just getting the cone beam while you're in the, the PA. And the second thing to say is obviously it'll help with collaterals. And so there's been plenty of times, especially with the prostatitis patients, you know, the vessels seem less compliant. They seem kind of stiffer. They're always harder to cannulate and just kind of get your catheters out. Um, and with the prostatitis patients, like I swear the radiation, I feel like it does. And maybe this is a topic I should, I should study. I feel like the rate of collaterals, you know, we're typically taught 20, 30% of all patients will have a collateral. Like, I feel like it's like 50% in prostatitis patients. Yeah, it's just, everything is just mucked up. So I don't know. In my opinion, I think definitely do the COBE. If you're going to start doing prostatitis patients, by all means, reach out, call me. I'm always happy to help. Actually, I was away at a conference and I went down to UT Houston um, and there's a friend of mine now and kind of a colleague who invited me down there. And then he was doing a PAE on like Thursday night. And so I was like at dinner at this conference and I was like, yeah, yeah, hang on. And he FaceTimed me. And he's like, dude, I'm five gray in, like, I need some help on like the right. And I was like, show me the runs. So, you know, always happy to help because that's what guys like Siobhan and Sonny did for me. I would just like call them in the middle of the case and they'd help out. So anybody needs any help, hit me up. Okay, I'm going to do it. So in terms of follow-up, is it any different for the prostate cancer patients um, and the post-prostatitis patients uh, relative to like BPH with LUT? Yes, prostate cancer, absolutely. So neoadjuvant. I get an MRI at six weeks and at 12 weeks and people make six weeks. both six weeks and 12 weeks. And I always ask the radiation oncologist to wait until the 12 week mark if they can. So we've already been on for a while and I'll spare the listeners, but prostate cancer is based on the, the PSA and the volume of disease and the pathologic appearance. So that's what they mean when they say Gleason three plus four, four plus three, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then they classify it as very low, low, favorable intermediate, unfavorable intermediate, high, and very high. Whenever you're in the high or very high, most of those men, they want to treat sooner rather than later. In the, in the intermediate category, um, they typically are willing to wait. So I always say, at the very least, give me six weeks and ideally give me 12. And then I leave it up to radiation oncologist. At the six week mark, definitely get an MRI and get the PSA because you want to make sure that there's no apparent spread. I've never had a patient who's found to have distant or um, regional METs at the six-week mark post-PAE. But I think it's incredibly important to think like your radiation oncologist colleague and make sure you're getting them the information that they need. Because obviously, 
if for some reason the patient is found to have METs, it completely changes the management. But does the PAE mess with the, the PSA level? Yeah, of course. It reduces it significantly. It should anyways. So that that is another thing that you're always going to want to trend for them, even though even though it's like only six weeks after the fact, you want to give them new baselines. And so they're always interested in the velocity, right? They're not interested in the level, they're interested in the velocity. And as you do this for focal therapy, and I have a cohort of patients for whom I do it in, in the setting of active surveillance, same thing, right? They, they're definitely going to want to know what the PSA is. So six weeks and 12 weeks prior to radiation therapy, I always will do an MRI and a PSA. Post-radiation prostatitis, actually, I don't do anything. Because as long as the PSA is undetectable, and that's how the radiation oncologist always manages them, then it makes no difference. Okay, Nine, that is really all I've got. Is there anything else that, uh, you know, I'm forgetting to ask you that you want to talk about relative to this? No, I mean, I think we covered it. I think that there's probably more to do and there's probably more to come in terms of, you know, prostate cancer and how we use PAE. Again, my own opinion is I think in either neoadjuvant setting prior to local therapy or prior to radiation therapy, and then in the post-radiation setting, I think that's the best utility for it. But I guess I should, I think one thing that my colleagues will always ask about, because we give a lot of talks around Florida and around the Southeast, radiation oncologists always ask about hypoxia. So they'll be like, well, if you're going to embolize the gland, like, how do I know that hypoxia is not going to be present? And how do I know that my radiation is really going to work? And I have like a whole slide on this and I can geek out and get more into it. But for the most part, I think there's a few things to recognize. First of all, as we talked about, peripheral zone cancer is more common um, by several factors, right? 85% of cancers are peripheral zone. 15% 15% are transition zone. In those peripheral zone cancers, it's rare that the BPH is actually, I'm sorry, in normal PAEs, when you look at the imaging, typically all of the PAE result is around the urethra of the central gland, right? So it's rare that I can even shrink the gland, or I can affect the, the cancer in the peripheral zone. Second thing to say is I can only really shrink the gland by like, I don't know, max 50, 60%. So the prostate is like getting blood flow from somewhere, right? And then the last thing is to say is, again, um, Dominic Abb's paper, there's at least partial necrosis of the cancer. So shouldn't that w- outweigh the, the philosophical lack of oxygen flow to the entire gland? That to me, when you put all those things together, that answers the question for hypoxia. Right on. Well, Nine, thank you for sharing your Saturday with us and your expertise. And uh, look, I look forward to, you know, the, to see the results of the projects you have ongoing and getting you back on here to do this again. Absolutely, man. I'd love to do it. And I'm happy to be here and happy to answer any questions if people you know are interested in them or they come up. All right. Thanks again to our listeners and uh, we'll catch you on the next one, Night. Thanks, Mike, for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Manisha Naganathanahali and Mandir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening.